hard. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 through 9, and Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 38. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1 through 9. When you have come into the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord, that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare the Lord, to the Lord your God that I have come to the, into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you will make this response before the Lord your God. Wander in Aramea, who was my ancestor, who went down to Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land. A land flowing with milk and honey. Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 21 through 38. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. He was the son, as was thought, of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Matha, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Jan, son of Joseph, son of Mattathai, son of Amos, son of Nahum, son of Sali, son of Nagai, son of Matt, son of Matthias, son of Simon, son of Joseph, son of Jodah. Son of Jonan, son of Risa, son of Jerubbabel, son of Shealtel, son of Neri, son of Melchi, son of Abi, son of Kosa, son of Almadan, son of Ur, son of Joshua, son of Elie, son of Joram, son of Matat, son of Rupaj, son of Simeon, son of Judah, son of Joseph, son of Jonam, son of Eliakim, son of Melia, son of Mena, son of Mazatha, son of Nathan, son of David, son of Jesse, son of Oban, son of Boaz, son of Salah, son of Nashon, son of Aminadab, son of Adnan, son of Arni, son of Hezron, son of Perez, son of Judah, son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, son of Terah, son of Nabor, son of Sarah, son of Ru, son of Peleg, son of Eber, son of Selah, son of Cana, son of Arphaxad, son of Son of Noah, son of Lot, son of Methuselah, son of Enoch, son of Jared, son of Mahaladil, son of Canaan, son of Enos, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. This is the word of God. Pastor John's message to me for today is entitled We Go Back a Long Way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, baby. <laughs> That is the one passage of scripture that most people hate. <laughs> and you did it. Thank you very much. And when I was thinking about this sermon, the genealogies, both in Luke and in Matthew, are part of the reason that I keep being reminded that you and I are just a moment in God's reaching out to humanity that we are a moment in this long stream of God's invitation for us to have a relationship with God. Another place where I have been faced with this is when I was a pastor in Northern California, I had a group of juniors, fourth to sixth grade, who call ourselves a vision 
scriptures, and I tried to introduce them to different forms of worship. We went to a Pentecostal service, we went to other services, and I took them to Sacramento, to the Greek Orthodox Church. And there, in the liturgy, and in the training of Orthodox Christians in their, in their baptismal training, they are aware and they think realistically that every time they gather for worship, this cloud of witnesses that is spoken of in Scripture from all to all past and in all the future that lies ahead, all of those who have been called by God and gathered by God into the church are there with them as they worship. And if you can begin to think of yourself in this moment, right, right now, that while we worship here, God's call for all these millions of people, beginning of time until the end of time, are part of our gathering. In some mystical sense, we are part of this huge church that God has created over the centuries. I don't know whether any of you have been in uh, Roman Catholic worship services, but in those services where the ritual is fitted out, many of the prayers that are included in their liturgy are identified by the person who prayed it and the year that it was prayed. And they go back centuries in some cases to the church fathers because we have a record of all the and what they wrote. 30 volumes I used to have in my library, and now it's all on a DVD. Finally, reading scripture. Uh, not only the genealogy, but when we read back through the scripture in the Old Testament, we see the working of God in the lives of people back then, and you and I are recipients of all their faith. The scriptures that we hold in our hand were told by storytellers in the, before there were books. I don't know whether any of you have seen the movie Fahrenheit 451. There's a society in the future that where books are banned and they're burned because the Rulers don't want people to have the knowledge that comes through all the past. And there's a, a secret community off in the forest somewhere. And nobody knows where it is, but they know that it's there, where people are books. Where each individual has memorized the full content of a book. So that the, the knowledge and the experience in those books is not lost. And that reminded me of the span of time that we have. We have the first slide. When Michelangelo painted this in the Sistine Chapel, he was trying to describe mystery. Adam on the left and God on the right, reaching out and not quite touching. Their fingers. Uh, God wanting to have a relationship with humanity, but something missing in the connection. And we saw it in the stories of Adam and Eve in the garden, and the fact that Adam and Eve got, had everything they would ever want, but they just couldn't let God set up a boundary for them. And they didn't know what they were doing, but they did it. They crossed the boundary and broke that relationship that God had had with them up to that point. And then the next slide. This is a depiction of Abraham. Next, God's attempt to bring humanity into a relationship with him was to pick a family. And Abraham's family became that link with God, with Yahweh. And it was the patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who continued this covenant with a family. And sometimes the family was faithful, and sometimes the family was unfaithful. 
And this thread, this, this attempt on the part of God to have this full relationship with humanity was ongoing, but it was still frustrating. Then along came Moses, and he got the burning bush. God sent Moses to do something a little different than he had done with Abraham. Moses was sent to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. Not just a family, but a whole people. A nation. And God took them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and took them to a land of milk and honey. And while they were going, they were resisting God. Sometimes they did what God commanded, but a lot of the times they just complained to Moses. And they finally came into the land. And then they went through a prophetic period where the prophets were warning them that they were losing touch with the covenant they had with God and there would be consequences. And God sent them into exile, not to so much to punish them, but to bring them back to him. And they missed being home and they were with a foreign nation that had defeated them and it was an unhappy experience and they longed to come home to their temple and so on. And when they did, they renewed their faithfulness to God as much as they were able to because they still sinned. And then Christ was born. And you know, the reason for these genealogies is to remind the times, the people in the times of Jesus that Jesus didn't just plunk in. It wasn't just a moment that God sent himself into the world. He had been trying for all this time. He had connected to a family connected to a nation and they still didn't pay attention to him and so he came himself in human flesh form to try to renew that invitation to humanity and discovered that even there even in the things that he did humanity rejected him and so what happened was his disciples in his resurrection saw a much larger view that God wanted to have a connection with everyone in the world, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well, the whole world. And since then, we have been invited by God into a, a relationship with him and with each other that is so expansive. Next slide. This is a depiction of John Calvin. And after Jesus was born and the church was established, the church institutionalized itself. And the institution became powerful. Um, popes put the crown on the emperor's head. And there's a depiction of an emperor kneeling in the snow, begging the Pope's forgiveness. And the reason he's begging the Pope's forgiveness is because when you are excluded from the sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church, you are excluded from the road to salvation. And even an emperor did not want to lose his soul, so he begged the Pope to forgive him. What are you reading in the papers this morning? that the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church in this Bay Area and larger, the Arch, Archdiocese, has ruled that um, yeah, and Nancy Pelosi cannot receive communion. When I come into the office on Tuesday, I'm going to write her an email and tell her she's welcome at our table. <laughs> but the point is, this is part of that struggle that God has had trying to have a relationship with humanity and have it the kind of relationship that God wants. And we keep, as humans, bring judgments into the matter, not waiting for God to tell us what's right and wrong. John Calvin was part of what we call the Reformation. When the corruption of the church in his day needed to be addressed, and so instead of the Bible being chained to the lectern and only the priest being able to read scripture, 
the reformers decided that the scripture needed to be translated into the language of the people and everyone should be able to read the Bible for themselves and make a decision for themselves as to what God said there. There was a, also a political change from having a, an individual who had power being able to make decisions for people to changing to a group of people making decisions about the people. And those people who were put in that position were elected by the people. They were put there by the people, and the people trusted them to look after their interests. And we have, have as Presbyterians, we have a session and a synod and a general assembly made up of people who are sent by their agencies to make decisions for the whole church. Now we come to our own time. I didn't know until this weekend that there was a result to what was called the Council of Church Union, COCU, back in 1962, started by the State Clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church and a bishop of the Episcopal Church who had a dream that the church would be one as Christ ended, that we'd be one in the same way that he and the Father were one. And they made a, a, a great attempt to find a structure in which all of the various denominations could be one. And you know what the problem was finally? Bishops of hierarchical churches wouldn't accept the idea that elders of the Reformed churches could be bishops, could be equal in status with them. And that ended the attempt to really put together a structure that was church one. However, I found out this weekend that it wasn't lost completely. And I didn't know this. That as of 2002, these same denominations, most of them that were part of COCA, formed an organization called the Churches Uniting in Christ. And they have decided that there are areas of church life that we can all have in common. People ordained in one group can be ordained or can be ministers in another. People who are members of these denominations can take communion in the other churches. They don't have to be examined. There are ways in which these churches that were in Koku now have made church one, even though not structurally. And I was pleased to find that out because that's one of the places where we really have been successful in trying to fulfill God's intent for us. At the same time, we're all aware that parts of the church have sought power rather than the gospel, and that we are living in a time that God will have to judge us on how we perform our faith, our discipleship. And then there's Sturge. And in 1923, a funeral of a Japanese man was held in San Mateo. And the minister that came down to do the funeral realized that San Mateo needed to have ministry for Japanese people. And so services were held at the beginning of, of the gathering of disciples who were Japanese began. And finally, Dr. Sturge came along. And in, on the day after Christmas of 1927, formed what was called the Independent Japanese Union Church. And it held regular services, and the Japanese community was given an opportunity at Christian worship and life. And then there was a destruction of the internment camps. And people left, and the church did not continue in the same way. And then finally, in, on July 1 of 1951, the first Sunday service was held 
of Sturge Presbyterian Church. And in September of that year, 1951, the first Sunday school was organized. And one of the first teachers was Mr. Pat Sacco, who we are remembering in another way now. So Sturge is part of this long history of God's attempt to touch humanity, bring those fingers together so that there is in on earth an adequate representation of God's intent and God's will for the creation. And it's important for us to recognize that when we gather, we're not alone. That the word of scripture that we have has been brought down to us through many, many iterations. That many, many millions of people have died so that we might know the faith today. That as we continue our ministry and our mission into the lives of others, we carry the gospel on into the future as part of that thread that God has been working on in eternity. It should make us feel better about ourselves. It should give us a purpose. It should help us understand who we are in God's kingdom. Because we didn't invent it. It was a gift to us. And it's one that we pass on to others. <clears throat> 